We're going to talk about disruption methods today, but to remind you why they're important, um, I'm going to remind you where we left off with functional MRI. So this is sort of a summary slide on some of what we know about the fusiform face area. At this point, loads of people have tested its response, measured its response to lots of different kinds of stimuli using functional MRI. Um, and so lots of different kinds of um, face stimuli produce a strong response and lots of other kinds of control stimuli that are not faces produce a much lower response. So if you haven't seen this image before, raise your hand if you can tell what this is. No one? Okay, one, two. Okay, raise your hand if you can tell what this one is. Okay, if you haven't seen it yet, don't worry, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a little subtle. It's a profile view of a face, eyes, nose, mouth. Everyone got that? Okay, here's the cool thing. That's the same stimulus. It's just upside down. This is a strong version of the face inversion effect that I've been carrying on about in here. If you use black, uh, black and white two-tone faces like this, the effect is so extreme that it's hard to see that it's a face at all. And that's very useful because it enables us, as the other cases I described to you, enables us to give a strong test of the selectivity of the fusiform face area and to ask, is it just something about the visual properties of that stimulus, okay? And you'll see the response is much lower for the upside down version when subjects don't usually even see there's a face at all than the right side up version when they usually do. So that's just one of dozens of examples of things people have tested um, uh, for the fusiform face area. And so at this point, it's really clear this region likes faces more than anything else, okay? Um, there's some response to things that aren't faces, just much lower. Um, oh, that was just to remind me to do the two tones. Um, this region is present in pretty much every normal person. We could scan any of you for 10, 20 minutes. Let me know if you're interested, we'll do that. Uh, and we could find this region in pretty much any of you somewhere right back there, okay? But the fact that this region is so selectively responsive to faces and present in every person, does that tell us that it's playing an important role in face recognition? Whenever I ask these questions, the answer is no, right? <laughs> Why not? My cheat sheet, Annie, where's Annie? Yes. Okay, why does the fact that the fusiform face area has this selective response to faces, why does that not tell us that that region plays an important role in face perception? Why does it not prove that case? It's suggestive, but it doesn't nail that case. Why not? We would, we would, but whatever the other parts of the brain are doing couldn't necessarily undermine whether that region is playing an important role. The key thing is that with functional MRI and with all of the other um, brain monitoring methods, ERP, MEG, intracranial recording, we are just watching responses go up and down as people do different things or look at different things. That's cool, it's suggestive, but it does not tell us about the causal role of those regions in perception. If we want to know about the causal role, we need to mess with the system. We need to disrupt it and say, if you didn't have that thing, could you still perceive, okay? Okay, so this is just to remind you all that this is why we're now moving on to consider other methods. So let's consider one of the major uh, methods in the field. I've talked about this briefly. I started this course with a story about a version of this method. And this is the case of learning from patients who have brain damage. Let me tell you about a particular example. This guy here is a gentleman in Japan. These are slices, pictures through his brain in this orientation like this, somewhere about here and near the back of his head. That's the cerebellum on the bottom. Everyone oriented? The little white thing that I've outlined in red is a lesion in his brain. This is an unusually small lesion. That's very useful. Usually brain damage is big and diffuse, and then people have lots of problems and it's hard to reason from that. This is one of the rare cases where the lesion was quite small. Now, when this, a paper on this guy was published, I very much wanted to scan him to see if that knocked out his fusiform face area. Um, but he's in Japan, he didn't want to travel, it was very difficult, I didn't get to scan him. We don't know exactly where his fusiform face area is or whether this lesion removed it. But for comparison, here's mine. So here are slices through my brain, uh, let's see, oriented like this going through here and going towards the back of my head. 
And you can see, that's my fusiform face area right there. Left and right are flipped, so that's right about in here on the bottom surface of my right hemisphere. Okay, and you can see, look at the similarity of the location of my fusiform face area and this guy's lesion. Okay? So it doesn't mean that it took out his FFA, but it means it might well have. Especially given that this guy can't recognize faces at all. He just is completely unable to recognize even um, close friends and family members. Okay? So, um, but the, the other critical thing about this patient is that he can't recognize faces, but he's absolutely normal at object recognition. They tested him on four different tasks, uh, testing different aspects of object recognition, and he performed no different than uh, control subjects on any of those tasks. Okay? So these are the kind of data that suggest that the fusiform face area is, ne is one, necessary for face recognition, and two, not necessary for object recognition. Everybody get that? But how that's telling us something we absolutely did not know from functional MRI alone. Okay? Okay. More generally, let me tell you a bit, little bit more about this syndrome called prosopagnosia, the selective loss of face recognition abilities after brain damage. Um, uh, typically, in the, uh, in the most pure cases, um, prosopagnosia disrupts the ability to recognize faces, to distinguish one person from another, not the ability to detect faces. So the title of Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, is totally wrong-headed, right? That does not happen in prosopagnosia, okay? Poetic license, but uh, not scientific. Um, I'll resist the temptation to say more about Oliver Sacks. Um, okay, great writer, I'll say that. Um, further, importantly, people with prosopagnosia, in the, in the pure cases, they do not have a deficit in voice recognition. This is important, because you might have thought, well, maybe they're just globally confused about different individuals and how they're different from each other. Or maybe they can't perceive the difference between one person and the next through any modality. No, they have no problem in voice recognition. They just can't tell who the person is from their face. Okay? Uh, you can, they also can match a name with a semantic description. You know, the person who was your roommate in college and now lives in blah, 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 whatever. Um, they can match the name. So they, their semantic information about people is fine. Their ability to recognize people through voices is fine, but face recognition in particular is disrupted. And in the clean cases, like the gentleman I just told you about, ability to recognize objects and to read and to get around in the world is just fine. Okay, so that's really quite selective. Powerfully complementing the evidence from functional MRI. Okay, blah, blah, I just said that. Okay, so just a few more details on this Japanese guy whose lesion I just showed you. Uh, at the time of the report, he was a 67-year-old retired uh, journalist who was unable to recognize even close family members. Um, he woke up with this deficit uh, one day and just realized that he couldn't recognize family members. This is how it works with a stroke. It's a very horrible thing. Out of the blue, you're fine, and then boom you get a blockage in one of the vessels in, in your brain and it knocks out a region of brain. Um, usually if you're an adult, you know, recovery, sometimes you get some recovery, but not a lot. It's, a, it's an awful thing. Uh, so this guy um, shows up at the hospital uh, and knew the, um, knew the doctor by, uh, by voice, um, but he could no longer recognize even his wife, okay? Um, he said he could identify family members uh, and friends by non-facial distinguishing features. So again, his vision is okay. His visual recognition in general is okay. Just face recognition is messed up. Three months after his stroke, um, the degree of his impairment remained so severe uh, that it really disrupted daily life. Okay. Um, notice his reading ability was intact. That's a very fine-grained visual task that you might think in some ways is similar to face recognition. But he, his reading was fine. Face recognition was not. Okay, so this is all very clinical and cold. It's actually a very horrible thing to have prosopagnosia. So I'm going to show you an ancient, but I think compelling, um, short movie segment of a person with prosopagnosia. Your mouth is getting hard. Meet Terry Sweeney, a professional photographer. She was a firefighter until an injury damaged part of her social brain, the circuitry she uses to recognize faces. The disorder is called prosopagnosia. 
For example, the person Terry has been photographing here is her mother. Now, because of her injury, Terry can't recognize any face. You make me smile. <laughs> Not even her own mother's. In this test, Terry takes a Polaroid picture of her mother. Terry, you just took a picture of your mother. Yeah. And I want you to take a look at these and see if any of them are the picture you took or not. They may... Now, Massachusetts General Hospital researcher Dr. Nancy Etkoff shows Terry several Polaroids with only faces showing and asks Terry to pick out her mother. Okay, if you had to guess, which looks to you the most like your mother? Just looking now, you can't tell which one of these. None of these really look like your mother to you. No. Okay. If you just cut up the face and I just look at the clothes, I can tell you. Okay, do you want me to uncover them? Okay, why don't I do that? I'll uncover them so you can see what they're wearing and other parts of the picture. And see, that's where it gets the, um, the pink and purple shirt. The shirt. Do you recognize the shirt? It's the hardest, I think, with my family, not to be able to personalize them mm -hmm. with a face or um, a sense of timing. You know, it's kind of like um, I've lost everybody, like everyone's gone. And all that I'm really left with are facts without faces, mm -hmm. you know? When Terry looks at these slides of famous faces, she can't recognize them. Although other cues, like hairstyle, prompt a guess. Is that Madonna? Because their hair, look at her hair. It's Marilyn Monroe. Oh, really? I always feel like I'm struggling and always feel like I'm fumbling through myself to find a connection, to find a bridge that'll just pull everybody right back all of a sudden. Can you tell who that is? No. Okay, I say Bruce Springsteen. That's not Bruce Springsteen, is it? <laughs> Why do you say that? This guy's ugly. <laughs> now, take a look at that woman right there. Does she look... Watch closely. ...at all familiar to you? No. Not at all. What if I say that to you? I bet that be me. <laughs> it is. Really? Mm -hmm. I show that to remind myself and you guys that we talk about this as fascinating, informative, and useful, but it's really awful. Strokes are very, very awful things when they happen to people. You could just see her face fall um, when she failed to recognize herself. Thank you so much.